Welcome to the Ad Extra Space Exploration Series. Following the visit of NASA astronaut Jeff Williams to Singapore, where you get to meet him or hear him at the science centers, at the universities, and in different social settings. We are going to bring you the next four episodes where astronaut Jeff Williams is going to bring you on a journey of space exploration. We're going to have four episodes covering rockets, the International Space Station, the mission to Moon or the Artemis project, and finally, what everybody is very interested about going to Mars. Well, you can watch the videos, but we have more in store for you. You watch the videos, complete the quizzes, and you get a special recognition, a certificate on space exploration signed by NASA astronaut Jeff Williams. This is an expired event with the partnership of Science Center Singapore, Singapore Institute of Technology, and Neo Aeronautics. Our last episode is Mars, the red planet. Now, in all science fictions, we all love to look at Martians. We write science fiction about interaction with them. Well, in the future, men might be able to travel to there. Right now, spacecraft is already on Mars, exploring like the curiosity, like the perseverance. So it's really no more science fiction. However, we can actually write about it based on science. And one person that I work with is Gerard Chua, who has a contract with NASA as an undergrad student in Singapore. And we are going to work on science fiction. And you can be a participant in it too. Let's hear from our expired partner, NASA astronaut, Jeff Williams. Thank you, Professor Neil. It's uh, great to be back with everybody uh, this evening or this morning here in Washington. Um, as uh, was mentioned, this is our last session in this series. You, uh, you may recall, or if you are just joining us, I, I can let you know that we, in the series, we, we kind of had a buildup. The first time we uh, got together, we talked about rockets and some of the principles of rocketry and what it takes to, uh, to get off the planet, uh, to get into space, even around Earth orbit, let alone beyond Earth orbit. Um, and then we talked about the space station, uh, and that is uh, most of my career has been dedicated to the space station. In fact, just about all of my time at NASA has been focused on the space station and the international partnership. And of course, that, that program continues to, uh, to fly and uh, the partnership intends to fly it for, for quite a few years to come in the future. Uh, I tried to uh, uh, express uh, how the space station supports uh, future programs and, and has always been envisioned to support future programs. It was not an end to itself, it's a means to an end. And last week we talked about the planned uh, return to the moon um, uh, the Artemis mission and some of the, uh, the near-term objectives of the Artemis mission, all of that with the, the global objective to build a uh, capability of a uh, permanent or semi-permanent in terms of a crew presence, um, uh, presence or operation in the, the lunar system that includes on the surface of the moon as well as uh, in orbit around the moon. I talked a little bit about how when you get out to the lunar system in orbit around the moon, you have already spent uh, the vast majority of the energy required to get out of the Earth gravity well. Uh, so it's envisioned that the, that the moon uh, will, uh, the lunar system will enable us uh, in the future to go to Mars. And Mars is what we're going to talk about today. It's going to be more of a philosophical talk because uh, we have not sent people there yet. However, the vision has always been, has a long been, uh, to send a crew uh, to Mars. And you'll hear that continually talked about in terms of uh, long-term goals. Uh, let's go, uh, I have a few slides and I wanna talk to to try to uh, illustrate uh, uh, the theme today of going to Mars. 
So let's put up the first one. Uh, of course, uh, probably most of you, if not all of you, have seen pictures uh, from Mars, from different rovers that have been sent there. Uh, Spirit and Opportunity were sent there a few years ago. There's been a lot of photography returned uh, from Mars from those rovers. Uh, Perseverance uh, is the more recent one. Uh, a lot, and that became uh, recently famous or very popular to watch because it was the first um, uh, test flight of a, of a helicopter um, uh, per, or Ingenuity, which has flown very successfully on Mars. That was a very interesting problem uh, and a problem related to some of the work that you might be doing in, uh, in your future challenges here uh, in, in competition in design, mission design and whatnot. Ingenuity is the first helicopter to fly on another planet, so it flew on Mars. Uh, being a helicopter pilot, it was I have great appreciation for the technical challenges of that uh, because uh, we fly and design helicopters here on Earth that uh, that assume one uh, g or the gravity of Earth, and in Mars you have one fifth of gravity. Uh, we design helicopters with a certain atmosphere assumed and. The higher you get an elevation here on Earth, uh, the less effective, the less performance uh, that the helicopter has. So you combine those, and then in Mars, of course, the atmosphere is a different composition. It's mostly carbon dioxide and uh, one fifth of gravity and uh, the very low density relative to the Earth. So it was a different problem uh, in terms of a helicopter, which made it uh, very challenging, uh, both aerodynamically as well as control of the helicopter. So it was quite a feat to get Ingenuity designed and sent to, to Mars and then operated from Earth uh, successfully. So those that just highlights some of the technical challenges that we face in, in going to Mars. But yet, Mars has fascinated us. It fascinates all of us. It is, uh, has a long history of fascination. The next slide, I tried to give you a glimpse in, into the history. Um, in the mid, or mid uh, 20th century rather, so the mid 1900s, um, Mars became very popular. And even before that, in the early 1900s and the early 1800s, it grew in popularity in science fiction. Uh, by the mid 20th century, the mid 1900s, uh, the science fiction was starting to uh, tra be transformed into, hey, we could do this. Uh, Werner von Braun, who of course is the, uh, the German rocket scientist who after World War II came to the US and, uh, and helped uh, develop the, the program that led us to the moon under Apollo in terms of developing rockets. He had a great vision, a uh, big vision for going to Mars. And, and uh, you see on the right part of the screen there, the book, The Exploration of Mars um, references Werner von Braun. He was, uh, he energized uh, the vision, if you will, uh, that transformed uh, going to Mars from the, being viewed as science fiction to being viewed as something that we could do that could be reality. There were a lot of, if you go back and uh, do a search, you'll find a lot of movies um, and uh, literature and, and uh, like these magazines shown on the screen, as well as books uh, through the 20th century uh, that, that popularized that vision. There's uh, lots of movies. Actually, Werner von Braun worked with uh, the Walt Disney um, in the 1950s, I think it was, and developed a series uh, that would inspire people to go to Mars. The uh, vision for space exploration was formulated about that time, too, to make it an official objective by the, from the United States to to explore space and send people to space. And even if you go back to about 1958, 1959, you can find objectives that said, okay, the US is going to develop the capability to, to, uh, to build a rocket, to get into earth orbit and then send um, a man to orbit or a crew to the orbit to develop uh, a space station from the space station, go to the moon and from the moon go on to Mars. That was envisioned in the late 50s. Of course, we, we skipped the space station in the 1960s, went directly to the moon. And uh, I think I touched on that earlier. That was driven completely by geopolitics uh, and the, the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. 
uh, and it was determined that we could probably beat them to the moon. We were neck and neck, if you will, go, building the space station and then going to the moon. So the decision was made to go to the moon. Uh, Werner von Braun, as I mentioned, uh, led that effort um, technically. Um, uh, and he was based at uh, uh, Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama. Um, it was, it's interesting, if you go back and look at his history, once we got to the moon, uh, successfully on Apollo 11 in 1969, Von Braun was immediately ready to start giving his, uh, his presentations to Congress and other policymakers to now let's go to Mars. And he had a, a plan to get a crew to Mars uh, by the early 1980s. Uh, he quickly learned that there was no, absolutely no political support uh, to do that. And it was shortly after that that he left uh, left NASA, uh, but that was his his vision. If we go to the next slide, uh, the next chart is one that I, I think has its origins in the early 1990s or so, or maybe even the 1980s. Uh, even though von Braun couldn't get any support uh, from the administration or Congress in the early 70s, the vision to go to Mars uh, never went away. And here you see, uh, of course, on the bottom of the screen, you see the planet Earth with the silhouetting uh, the space shuttle. And above that is the space station. And uh, this was the, uh, the early uh, vision of the space station freedom in the 1980s. And then the, the, in this artist's depiction, you see the space station being built by the space shuttle, which was the shuttle's primary purpose and intention when it was designed and envisioned and, and uh, agreed to, uh, to develop was to put up the space station. Uh, but still beyond that, you see envisioned the moon, the small sphere there above the space station, and then beyond that Mars. If you look at crew patches uh, for, from space shuttle missions, from International Space Station missions, you will often see present the elements present in the patch that include the moon and the Mars. So it's always been there, the vision's always been there to go to Mars. Uh, again, this picture is, uh, I think, dated the late uh, 80s or so. If you go to the next picture, the next slide, it shows the same thing. Uh, this slide was, I don't have the exact date, but it was uh, in, a, in the 2000s, in the mid 2000s, this slide was generated. Again, you see the earth in the lower left-hand corner, you see the space station uh, flying at the time. Uh, you, you see that that was called phase zero. Um, and I talked uh, last week about the purpose of the space station in part being technology development to uh, enable future exploration. It's still, it's still the case and it was envisioned here. It's shown here on the, on the, on the slide. Uh, that's why they call it phase zero of this overall uh, exploration plan uh, strategy. You see the arrow going all the way out to Mars and it's talking about advancing the technologies and and also uh, they added uh, uh, creating economic opportunities. If you study the history uh, of humanity, uh, economic opportunities always in the final analysis always drove uh, the exploitation, if you will, of, of exploration. When things were discovered, uh, when new continents were discovered, when uh, new capabilities were were uh, developed, uh, for example, to be able to travel across vast oceans and see what was on the other side. It was the economic opportunity that, that drove uh, subsequent um, follow-up to new discoveries. And, and so that's gonna be the case in the future as well, both for the moon and to, to Mars. On this slide here, you see phase one then. Uh, and at the time the slide was written, it was envisioned in the 2020s. And of course, we still are hoping in the 2020s getting to the moon. Um, this slide calls it cis lunar. It's the, the lunar system. So it includes the, the various orbits around the moon um, uh, and the different uh, points, it, uh, not only orbits around the moon, but if uh, a little bit of an advanced uh, topic, I guess, 
that you could go research on your own. There's points like that are called L1 and L2. They're stable points between the Earth and the Moon. Both, uh, uh, well, one is is between the the Moon and the Earth, and the other one is on the other side of the Moon. Uh, but it's a stable point that doesn't orbit anything except the Earth, but along with the Moon. I leave that for your assignment to go research that what L1 and L2 is, and there are other points out there too. But that's in the it's considered in the lunar system. Lots of opportunity there out of the Earth's gravity well, as I said before. Uh, so a very key development that needs to take place to enable future um, exploration. You get into phase two, and the slide calls it uh, deep space transport and Mars verification mission. Before we send a crew to Mars, we have to confirm that we can get them there safely, that we can get them on the planet surface safely, that we can get them off the, the surface and return to Earth. So it's going to take a lot of technology development and verification. So we're going to have some, some uh, uncrewed missions that go in advance uh, that provide that capability, that verify the capability for, uh, uh, for getting to Mars and returning safely to Earth. Uh, the next... Uh, major milestone that you'll hear talked about is a sample return. That'll be a robotic mission that goes to Mars, gets to the planet, grabs uh, some soil samples and rock samples uh, from the surface and then returns them to the Earth. And of course, that'll be a pathfinder for, for later uh, using a similar capability to get a crew there and back. Uh, so that's what this calls phase two. Phase three and four, of course, is actually uh, the, the crewed operation on uh, the Mars uh, surface. So here's a, this slide again is from the uh, 2000s, um, same vision that goes all the way back to the, at least the 1950s, late 1950s. Next slide. The next slide uh, uh, touches a little bit on what I talked about last week. I talked about the Artemis program. Uh, so th this is, it takes a little bit uh, narrower sliver in time from the previous slide, but it, it just demonstrates uh, in a little bit more granularity, this overall vision still with Mars in, in the in vision, in focus uh, in the upper right-hand corner of the slide and all this, these elements of the envisioned operations on the moon and near the moon uh, both in an orbiting space station around the moon, as well as operations between the space station and the surface of the moon. Uh, Semi-permanent is a, uh, where a crew goes out for, for a time and then returns to Earth, and then there's a gap and another crew goes out a little bit later. But all along, developing the capability, broadening the capability, developing new technologies, proven the operational concepts uh, that will eventually then go to Mars. Mars is much harder, much harder to get to than the moon. We're, we're, we are relearning just how hard it is to get to the moon and to operate on the moon relative to the space station. I talked two weeks ago about the logistical requirements uh, needed to support the space station. Spare parts, uh, simple things like food and clothing, keeping the air quality on the space station. It is it is very challenging, very hard to do. Uh, we've been doing it for uh, well over 20 years now, uh, going on 21 years of continuous human presence, uh, but it's still hard to do. And that's in Earth orbit. Going to the moon is going to be an order of magnitude more challenging. Uh, we won't be able to sustain it continually like we do with the space station because of those challenges. Um, but the moon will be much harder to, uh, to execute in the long term. And then Mars is an order of magnitude beyond that. So it's, uh, it, it, it's easy to, to underappreciate uh, the challenges uh, that, will, that will need to be met uh, for going to Mars. I'll just uh, give you one example of going to Mars, and it's in the next slide. And just so if you haven't thought about it before, um, obviously, going to the space station, you launch a rocket, get into Earth orbit. It flies about 250 miles above the Earth's surface. Uh, but it, in, in a relative scheme, it's, it's fairly simple, fairly well understood. Going to the moon, it's a little bit more complicated because now you, you leave the, uh, 
the effect of the Earth's gravity and you enter the, uh, the gravitational influence of another body being the moon. Uh, when you go to Mars, it's even more complicated than that. And I think it's obvious to most of you, but now you are leaving the Earth and where the Earth has uh, the, uh, the primary um, uh, force uh, on a spacecraft, uh, the Earth's gravitational force, and you need to provide enough energy to get away from the Earth's gravitational force and go by the moon, which also influences your trajectory leaving the Earth. Uh, but then you essentially get into an orbit around the sun and you depart the Earth. Uh, but you have to depart the Earth on a plan that puts you on a trajectory where you intercept uh, the, the target planet Mars. So you have a, a fairly narrow window of opportunity uh, at any given time to launch from the Earth uh, to then enter an orbit around the sun uh, that will eventually intersect uh, the Mars orbit at where as you approach Mars, then you come under the, 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 the influence of the Mars gravitational field and you use that as your advantage to, to stay there once you arrive there, to stay, to enter the orbit around the Mars uh, and to stay there and not just fly by uh, and stay in a broader orbit around the sun. Uh, so all that's very complicated, obviously, and, um, and it's, uh, it's very costly in terms of the energy that's required. It, the precision of it is, is very tight. Uh, like I said, you have a narrow uh, window of opportunity uh, to launch from the Earth and to enter the trajectory and then uh, uh, rendezvous with Mars. Uh, there's different ways to get there. Uh, if you're familiar with the term phasing, phasing would be, at, uh, the phase would be at any point in time, the relative location of the earth in its orbit around the sun uh, to the location of Mars in its orbit around the sun. If they were on opposite sides of the sun, the phasing would be 180 degrees. If Mars was directly out uh, from Earth, from the sun, the phasing would be zero degrees. Uh, phasing matters you know, for the launch opportunity because the trajectory like depicted here in the green arc assumes uh, the current position of Mars where you see it in the lower right-hand corner, but it's gonna be in the top of the, the, the red circle when it intersects there. So phasing matters. Uh, other um, characteristics of the two orbits matter, uh, but it limits the opportunity you have to, uh, to launch to go to Mars. It also drives your duration to get there. Uh, the, the, both the phasing as well as your propulsion system uh, to get there. So one of the major challenges to get to Mars, of course, is a propulsion system that will make the time reasonable to get there to support a crew. We send robotic rovers there. We have sent many of them there. Uh, they can endure a longer period of time. Of course, you don't have to feed a rover uh, or care for a rover in terms of an atmosphere or other life support systems. Uh, but a, a crew you do, humans you do. So you want to minimize the time to get to Mars. You also want to minimize it uh, on the return as well for obvious reasons. So that just gives you a little bit of a, um, an idea of the challenge, one of the technical challenges of getting to Mars relative to, uh, to just getting off uh, Earth in Earth orbit or, or going to the moon. I think with that, um, I will, uh, that's the last slide I have. Now you're ready to do the quiz, to participate in space exploration. Sign up to the link below. Thank you.